Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining me. This is Ian Blackburn and another edition of Zoom into Wine. And I thank you for your time and joining me here every Wednesday night at seven o'clock. We take on an interesting set of topics in the wine world and taste some great wines, sending out little tasting kits far, near. Got some folks trying to get on that can't get on, so we'll see if they can make it or not. But we record this at our Facebook page for Zoom into Wine or the Merchant of Wine on Facebook. And also uh, for our uh, YouTube uh, channel at learnaboutwine.com, which you can pick up that video in about 48 hours after the event takes place on YouTube, but it's immediately available on Facebook. All right, let's get started and take a look at what we have for this evening. Tonight we're talking about the Loire Valley, and I pulled together a set of wines that I think are true representatives of the Loire Valley and really kind of showing us a nice cross-section of of wines. There's a couple of wines here that are more on the value side of the fence, but uh, a, a, a real classic lineup. And, um, you know, when you run a wine store, uh, you have a lot of different options from the Loire Valley. It's a large and very important producer in a volume context, but also um, the category of Sancerre, Vouvray, uh, Muscadet, these are, and Chinon, these are classics, and there's lots of, lots of little um, opportunities there, and I love to taste these wines, I love to visit the Loire Valley, um, it's a really beautiful and uh, expansive zone, it's not very well populated, except for in the major tourist towns, like Tours, um, but you could really get out there and see some amazing sites. Of course, you've got all these historic landmarks that are protected, these gigantic castle type properties with 100 acre English gardens and um, you know 100 bedroom estates that prior to the French Revolution were really signs of wealth. But after the French Re uh, Revolution had brand new owners, and they were probably the state that um uh that you know took took over the properties and, and and protected them and and now they're more of a museum so uh there's quite a bit to get to here in our topicality tonight so let's begin we'll get right into the Wa valley taking a look at the map kind of going from left to right near the oceans where you get some great oysters. So you got to have a wine like Muscadet with your oysters. It's absolutely like the official wine with oysters. And we're going to start with that wine tonight. Uh, this is a, a special wine because this producer makes, makes it in a really long aging style and imported by a very important company called Vineyard Brands. Um, I purchased the 2014 vintage recently. Um, this is this is how they do it. And so we've got a 2014 Muscadet that we're going to be getting started with. And let's take a look, you know, uh, on our map here. We are close to the ocean in Muscadet. And um, there's there's some really wonderful sites over here. This is an area that I haven't yet explored, but I plan to. We found a really interesting property over here that has like a, it's like a Michelin recommended spot. Not I'm not a big Michelin star fan per se, but to be able to go someplace that's Michelin recommended, they're uh, really uh, a couple of their core products um, of course, the the oyster, um, baleen oyster, and the the butter that comes from this area really, really um, key uh, ingredients. And so um, we'll take a look at this first wine, and we'll talk about it uh, at, at length here, and then we'll get on to wine number two. 
But here's our here's our label, a really significant bottle. So you can really uh, see that the dark glass, the also the weight of the glass. This is like seriously made for the seller. It's one that you can enjoy at any point in time, but really has moved into a state that's pretty consistent. We're going to taste it tonight um, at length, but um, I, I when I tasted it on Monday, uh, I was reminded, you know, I bought this wine over a year ago, and it really is very consistent at this point. And I think it's going to stay in this state for another five to 10 years. But you could buy wines from this producer from the 1970s right now, white wines. So really pretty interesting. Um, and here's here's the map showing us where exactly we are at. And this winery is a state... Um, uh, it, it, this first of all, there's a whole new wave of quality in uh, in France, and they're really trying to elevate some of the vineyards, some of the sites, and reward really good behavior. Um, and so, some of the vineyards have recently been classified in the, into the cru market. Maybe someday they'll have a premier cru, maybe even a grand cru in Muscadet. Um, so this this set of the family has run the property uh, since 1979, but the chateau has been there since the 14th century. Here is the property that we are tasting tonight and the family. We've had them on the Zoom in the past. Really nice, friendly, uh, very thankful. And uh, the wines made from a grape called Milan de Bourguignon, which is no longer in Burgundy, but at one point in time was found there. Of course, over time, Burgundy became very strict and restricts the white grape to be just Chardonnay. But at one point in time, uh, Milan may have uh, been found there. I'm, tonight, I'm going to use my, the Zaltos just came in back in the stock. If anyone needs some more Zaltos, they've been out of stock for about, I don't know, three, four months. And so we're going to start doing some more Zalto activity. Um, but I'm going to use the universal glass tonight with my Muscadet. And I'm using the Coravin Vintage Needle, which I hate because it's so slow. But it does work really well. As I put this in the glass, and my wine here is pretty chilly, just got back to the office right in time to start the Zoom, and so I pulled this wine out, but you want to actually drink this wine just on a warm day, you're sitting out on the patio, you've got uh, you know friends over, you're going to have some oysters, you may be at a picnic, um, you want this wine as cool as possible. Twenty nine months aged on fine lees in the tanks at the winery, bottled after tartaric precip precipitation, meaning they cold stabilize the wine so all the tartaric acid crystals form, and then they remove those from the wine because when you get a white wine really cold, the tartrates will bond and it looks like shards of glass in a bottle. It will not hurt you. It's just unattractive. And people start to send a lot of crazy emails thinking that the glass bottle broke, stuff like that. Yes, Muscadet is number one, sorry. Wendy, did you get that okay? All right, very good. Yeah, so here's a look inside of their cellars. And I think what we're we're looking at uh, some some wood barrels. They do uh, use some wood, small amounts of wood, but most of the wine is in tank and not in wood. Here's a look at the bottle again, twenty two ninety five. Um, I think this classic as one of the great values. In fact, I think ten years ago this wine was twenty two ninety five. Um, it really hasn't moved. And the, there's a lot of downward pressure in Muscadet uh, on pricing because it can get a little generic. This is not generic. This is high quality. 
ageable, beautiful, good producer, great reputation. Uh, really, uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it even more now in this relaxed setting than when I was working and getting the setup. And quite frankly, the, even though this wine was chilled as cold as you can get a white wine, it's exactly what feels good right now. After a long day, my first sip of wine today. Really restrained, very uh, linear. It's not the most complex wine, but that's why they do a little bit of lees aging, a little bit of um, bottle aging, bottle conditioning. Gives it uh, just the right amount of, there's a good amount of concentration here too. When you have other muscadets, that tend to be really lean, kind of bitter, um, uh, bright and crispy uh, to handle that saltiness and stuff of the, of, a, of an oyster or some seafood. I, you could easily cross this over into other cuisine as well. But uh, I like it a lot. I hope you did as well. I do have um, maybe eight bottles of this wine remaining, not a bunch. I could probably go back and buy the 14 again. Um, I'm not sure if it would remain 22, I think every year. They take the current vintage, move it back a year, raise it up a dollar or two a bottle. Now they're selling the 15 or the 16, and it'll be probably in line to be the $22.95 price point. So this is uh, just something fun to be able to know about a little bit. Muscadet, Servimon. Servimon is the appellation, and um, Muscadet is the name of the wine, the place, and it is made from Milan de Bourguignon. Um, and super, super fun, super uh, festive and great with food. I like it also with sushi. Um, and I, these are the type of wines that I take out for sushi. I am not a sake guy. I am a sushi fan and I love wine with sushi. I love uh, mostly champagne, a wine like this, potentially. A Pinot Noir, and sometimes Gamay. Those are kind of the wines that I would take out for sushi. And uh, uh, almost anything else is probably just a little too big and a little too um, bold for the fish. But these are wines I'm really comfortable with taking out for sushi. Uh, you guys are on the Zoom with me. We're all live. You're all welcome to ask questions. You're all welcome to give me some input. Uh, what did you think of that first wine? It's really no fun talking to myself. So that's why I'm encouraging you guys to chat me up. Natalie, everything well? I could... If I could find the unmute button. Yes, everything's great. You're, Fabulous. You're doing something busy today, huh? You just got to this glass of wine. I just got to this glass of wine. I I had a board meeting that went all, I mean, so for me right now, it's nine o'clock my time. Yeah. 9.15. So board meeting that was supposed to go from five to seven that went until eight. And then I like ran home and you know, checked in with all the kids and now I'm, I'm ready. I'm sucked so. in, getting sucked in. It's, is that wine turn. cold? Is that wine cold now? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's been in the fridge since like three o'clock. So we're good. Perfect, perfect. Perfect. I hope that kind of, kind of recenters you. Mm, yeah. It's, it's fabulous. Yeah. Michael, what are you thinking? I, I think it's a very nice wine and your suggestion of oysters sounds terrific. Uh, unfortunately, I have a little bit of cheese in front of me and that doesn't quite do it. Okay. It's probably a little um, boring with the cheese. I, I actually prefer some, some little bit of bolder white wines with cheese often, but right. champagne, some, some brie, maybe do you have some brie with a wine like this? That could be very good. Tragically, no. Okay. All right. Or what are those cheeses that have like a uh, salt kind of on the on the on the rind? Maybe mm. that would be good, right? Because you want the salty. 
that could be sometimes they get a little uh you know the drier a cheese gets or older a cheese gets as, a, as that evaporative quality takes over just leaves those salt crystals in it um those those are the opportunities also for reds but uh i i, I might think a little comp day would work really well here because it's really earthy and fun and uh, I love my cheese. And in fact, in November, I'm going to do a wine and cheese pairing on Zoom and send those out. So if you guys want to participate, be on the lookout for that November wine and cheese Zoom. Uh, I think there's some chocolate involved too. So we can do a little red wine as well. And uh, so that's something we're going to have some fun with. We always like to change it up here. Yeah, we're in. We're, we're in for that. All right. Well, let's take a look at wine number two as we go from Muscadet down the river. We're going to go over to Sancerre, and this is uh, basically the other end of the river. <clears throat> and a wine that I've probably used a couple of times over the past few years, but never the 2022. We just got the 2022. The 2021 vintage uh, was really small because in 2021 in France, some radical weather, lots and lots of rain and um, in the summer washed away a lot of opportunity. Uh, Champagne was decimated. Champagne's not too far away from the Loire Valley. And uh, Loire Valley production numbers were about they were down about 70%. So the 21 vintage, not, and we, we're talking about wine that was trying to come into America, you know, in a very difficult time with those crazy container costs, supply chain was broken. And the little bit of wine that made it to this country uh, in 2021 was, was consumed pretty fast. So, uh, you know, in, in difficult times like that, the importers really take it on the chin because they have to pay those container costs and not really raise the wines because you can't just take the wine and toggle the price a lot. So they had to hold steady on the pricing and take it on the chin on those container costs, but they didn't bring in a bunch of it because they kept hoping that container costs would come down. So now, finally, the 2022 has arrived. Now I get did get to taste this wine with a member of the Alphonse Malo team in Hollywood at a, one of those trade tastings that we go we get invited to every once in a while. It's a really consistent, high quality producer that has great land holdings and does things in a particularly high quality way, very dependable. stalling for a minute because I am pulling my samples tight out of the bottle with the Coravin. I'm using the thinnest of needles, the vintage needle. Now, Sancerre, number two. This is Sauvignon Blanc. And we're in the extreme eastern side of the Loire Valley River. Um, the Loire comes out over here. And the first time I ever went to France, I got to go to Sancerre and I was welcomed by a really great small producer who brought me in his Range Rover down into the river, got out wearing like waist high boots, jumped out of his car into the river, reached down and grab sand from one side of the river and then a different type of sand from the other side of the river. There's a real amazing set of soils here. And uh, it just showed me how basically these, the, the rivers kind of fork together, they're bringing different elements together, different stone from different places. And um, it was it was really fascinating to me and enlightening that they paid attention. So when his he had vineyards on both sides of the river, 
and they were both growing in two very different soil types, but the river had both types of soils that it had eroded into it. Um, Sancerre is right next to Puy sur Fume. So Puy Fume is also a Sauvignon Blanc. Typically, the difference between Sancerre and Puy Fume is that in the Fume area, they tend to be a little bit more uh, experimentative with use of wood, um, separating them a little bit in price point, elevating them a little bit. And Puy Fumes, they, if you can let them age, they're bigger, they're bolder, they can take on some color. Sancerre tends to be a little fresher, a little leaner a little more aromatic, a little brighter, a little cleaner. And Alphonse Melo is a really important house, like I said. Again, you know, history is crazy when you start talking about, you know, how long some of the, the Appalachians have been around, the, the, the merchants, the families. Um, Caesar Melo was appointed as the wine advisor to Louis, is that uh, the 14th? In 1698. So, uh, <laughs> you know, what's interesting too is that as you when you meet a, a Melo family member, they they really look like they're from a different time too. I mean, they have these classic French features and really look like they're right out of a painting from the from the past. Uh, the bloodlines are pretty pretty true here with the Melos being in Sancerre, living in Sancerre, working in Sancerre. They're major landowners too. They own a lot of real estate, uh, both commercial and vineyard, and uh, very successful, very successful. Mr. Melo is also a Harley Davidson fan, and he is one of the only people certified by Harley Davidson to fix motorcycles in France. He's got his hobbies. This is a look at the beautiful hills. Look, you know, these hills create the opportunities for great, great growing because that subtle angle stresses the vine just amount, the right amount. You don't have this real deep, rich soils that just collect moisture and lots of water kind of rolls down the hills. So the right up on the sides of the hills is where you're going to find the best vineyards. Sancerre looks like this everywhere. It's just these this wonderful set of rolling hills, really green, really lush. Not a lot of people. Um, and they've been farming it for a long time. So very classic, very predictable. 100% Sauvignon Blanc. No, no uh, varietal blending in Sancerre. It's 100% Sauvignon Blanc. And, uh, you know, they do make Sauvignon Blanc like in Bordeaux. Um, they'll make a white wine with maybe even using Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. Um, a third grape Friday, I don't want to confuse you, called Muscadel. Um, but it's not uh, the same as, and it's not a Muscat. It's it's just a, it's another grape Friday that's very similar to Sauvignon Blanc. But they'll but they'll make a Bordeaux style, and it's fairly oxidative, and it's a blended style, and it's got uh, some different characteristics to it. Sauvignon Blanc from Sancerre is very pure, very clean, very fresh, very hyper aromatic. You can really smell that uh, almost white flowers, grapefruit, that citrus peel. There's almost a, a little bit of a greenish freshness to it like a very youthful piercing just like if um you know the first wine was subtle restrained this wine's just kind of singing and thumping and you got a lot of persistence a lot of energy this is what people expect in Sancerre. Uh, oh, the, the soils, I, uh, were, as we were talking about earlier in the river, Carm I'm sorry, Kimmeridgian marl. This is uh, like a, a fossilized sea creatures, oyster shells, sea snails, you know, uh, uh, any kind of seashell. 
activity and limestone, which is also a product of the sea, the ocean, all the sediments that came down. So this is uh, kind of the main composition of the Sancerre soils. The vine age here at Alphonse Malo, 55 years. So those are those are would be usually called old vines, but he doesn't because he actually has really old vines and he makes some really crazy wines from his old vines. I have on the website um, a 2016 wine called Satellite that is from really old vines uh, uh, of his. I only have a couple bottles. They it's just kind of experimentative. I'm going to use it some point, some fun dinner somewhere. Um, but uh, really a, a, a top-notch producer who invests in, in great technology. The winery is beautiful. Uh, if you were on the Zoom before, we went extensively into the use of the wood egg. But uh, also cement eggs are a really big thing happening in Sancerre as well. <clears throat> um, here we, we do use a little bit of lee stirring, but uh, very keeps it very fresh. Not a lot, a lot, a lot of time on the lees. Just a little bit of leaf stirring for texture, and then uh, keeps it fairly clean and bright by not leaving the leaves on in contact for a really long time. Um, this is the brand new 2022. I've got it priced very aggressively. When these things come into the market, there's a lot of competition. We are sensitive to that at Merchant of Wine. Um, I think I actually was able to bring the price down from the 2021. Uh, and, and, and working pretty hard on that at $32.95. But Sancerre, I have others that are, you know, closer to 40 and into the 40s. And this, this wine has moved up in price and in popularity pretty radically over the last few years. I'd say this really took a lot of market share from Chardonnay and has become a, a you know, kind of pretty viable uh, topic again. Sancerre has always been a, a very good seller, but they've always made so much of it as a category. And now the world is waking up and saying, okay, let's take it up a notch. And we're drink out drinking Sancerre's production. And so prices will continue to creep up until that changes. Questions, comments? Yay or nay on this one, guys. Hey, Ian, can you uh, talk a little bit about the, I was reading on um, that last slide and then also online you, uh, about the, the designate, the prestigious designation of, is it or concord? That says we are the only estate in the region to have this prestigious distinction bestowed upon us. Do you know anything about that? I'm going to try to find out where you see that. It was on your last slide too, hmm. when you were talking about the wine. But I, I was just curious what that what that designation is there on the, the first sentence of your second paragraph. It's okay if you don't. I was just curious. I'd never heard of that before. Honestly, don't. Yeah, we are the only estate in Sancerre to have the prestigious. Or's concours beyond competition is the distinction bestowed upon us. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would be referring to. Um, and the Lamusserie Vineyard is our cornerstone. It's terroir, precise gifts, and generations past lie in the very heart of the Sancerre Appellation. Lamusserie, that's the name of the, of the vineyard and the estate, uh, is their flagship cuvee, uh, their largest production. Um, but I don't, I, 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 I'm going to, rem, I do remember him being very proud of getting recognized for his innovative um, and real, like they are very hardcore about being sustainable and uh, creating, you know, uh, less carbon footprint all of those things matter to him and the future of the region. So I'm going to bet if we uh, search that out a little bit more, it's relating to his 
industry leading grape growing and wine production techniques that are steering Sancerre in the right direction. Mm -hmm. so those are the type of things that I hear from him. But it's not an award that I've ever seen gifted, uh, nor do I know who gifted it. All right. A unique wine. Uh, one that was made for value. Um, and, and it's kind of because this appellation, Chevrony, isn't necessarily, doesn't have the prestige of a Vouvray or a Sancerre or even a Muscadet for, you know, because at least when you say that word, people say, oh, I know you're talking about Sauvignon Blanc, or I know you're talking about Malon, or I know you're talking about Chenin Blanc. Not in Chevrony. Chevrony, kind of the rules come off and the artism, artisanal opportunities start to appear. We are uh, a little ways away from Sancerre, a little ways away from, from Muscadet, closer to Tours. We're out here in kind of this zone where there's a lot, there's, there, are, um, there are artisanal producers and there are large production producers in the same zone. And, and there's this really large set of grape varieties that they're allowed to grow in this area. Um, here mentioning Sauvignon Blanc, um, Pinot Noir, Gamay, a grape called Cot, C-O-T, which is actually Malbec, uh, Cot. Um, so the red grape holdings are pretty significant, but here they're also able to grow some Chenin, some Chardonnay, and um, it's it's just kind of like a large uh, plots and large vineyards and so potentially you know finding crop that can have some value might might be a little more difficult this is probably more of a volume area um, but this producer has done a good enough job to get the attention of Kermit Lynch and Kermit brings it in as an opportunity for a value wine from the Loire Valley it is a blend of Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay. Anticipation as well. Um, if you if the name Kermit Lynch, and let me take off my background picture and share with you. Um, here we go. Get rid of background picture. On the back label, the Kermit Lynch logo is pretty identifiable. A lot of people see that and recognize it. Um, he was a, a he's a merchant in in uh, Berkeley and started back uh, before the French wine industry was really aggressive in marketing um, and uh, really loved to travel to France, became good friends with a number of wineries, started bringing like he, he didn't have some of these wineries didn't have importers. And so he's like, I'll, I'll let me bring you into my store. I want to carry small producers. I, I really think are special. And he was a student. He was into it. And he went to France and was like the exclusive importer of these wines at a time when nobody thought about it. And uh, they uh, he did a good job. And he said, okay, let me take this out a notch. And it's created a, his own distribution company. So he's not only the exclusive importer, but he has his own retail store um and sells a lot of his own wine but uh these are these are wines that are um well distributed by a really cool team my my kermit lynch team is awesome they come and school me on all of these wonderful opportunities and i get some really cool stuff from him he expanded his empire into italy corsica 
And um, so there's a lot of really interesting wines, a lot of very prestigious brands that you can only get if you support the Kermit Lynch portfolio as well. So uh, we we definitely dabble around and find some great things. My other Sauvignon Blanc that I sell a lot of is Hippolyte Reverdy, and that is a Kermit Lynch wine. Um, and that's in the $40 range. And um, it's very popular and has been out of stock for a long time and just came back into stock as well. So um, there you go. So this is a smaller producer, Chevrony Value. They do uh, play around with a lot of different special blends. Everything oh, okay. to be in the Kermit Lynch portfolio. you got your speaker on, I'm about to mute you. Sorry about that. Um, the To be in the Kermit Lynch portfolio, you got to have a pretty high ethos in the way you make wine. You probably got to own your own vineyards. You can't just be buying fruit and you've got to have a great site and he's got to believe in you. So lots of, lots of um, criterion there to be able to be in the book, but you don't have to have a big marketing budget. And some of these labels are pretty bad. <laughs> the label's pretty simple. Um, that's that's the label. But authentic, super authentic. And here's the here's the joy. Nineteen dollars. I think it it tastes like a Sauvignon Blanc. It has a little more oomph than some Sauvignon Blancs of this area would have if you didn't met, uh, blend in some Chardonnay. Um, again, it's a fairly high yielding area where you're going to get a lot of volume. You're not, you know, these these special places with the with uh, great soils and the perfect conditions to make high quality wine. And then you got places like Chevrony that can really produce some volume, but to make a better wine, you have to maybe blend it a little bit or, or uh, you know, uh, go against the grain and try to teach these vineyards not to uh, um, mass propagate. Um, and that's, that's uh, difficult to do. So here you got a producer that really focuses on making something of value, but that's delicious. And uh, I think it's a fun wine. If uh, we want to sit around, if you, if you are a Francophile, you like the smell of earth and stone, wet uh, concrete, that kind of, of thing where there's a, a little subtle little lemony lemon peel I can get lost in the in the terroir characteristics of the French wines. I don't even need food to like these wines now because it's kind of where, um, you know, I'm I'm going to find the most joy is 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 really leaning into the acid profiles of wines like this. This has great acidity, um, and it's the alcohol here. You're looking at twelve and a half, maybe. Just confirming that. Yeah. So either 12 or 12 and a half. I think that says 12.5. Someone left me a chat there. You said you like this one a lot. Were you referring to that little one there, the uh, Chevrony Blanc? Or was that the Sauvignon Blanc comment? Wendy. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. We were we were referring to this one, the Chevrony. Oh, excellent! Glad Very you nice. like. It. Very. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, that's a treat. My favorite so far. All right. It's fun to to find some things that maybe you haven't had before. Take a chance on them. And hear, hear that people like them. So thank you. I'm glad you like it. Moving into another wine. 
Vouvray. Um, this is made of Vouvray's Chenin block, okay? And Vouvray has, oh boy, Vouvray, they can make a lot of different wines in Vouvray uh, stylistically. Off dry, dry, sparkling. Um, I think, quite honestly, that's a mistake to have so many options because I, I want to trust when I open up a Vouvray what I'm going to be getting. Am I going to be getting something dry or am I going to be getting something off dry? And it really kind of comes down to the producer. And tonight, our producer is pretty famous for making very dry styled um, wines from Chenin Blanc. Um, this is a, a family owned operation, again, from Kermit Lynch, just realized that. Um, Champolo is a very credible house. Everything they do is sustainable. They have a lot of very old vines. And this is kind of what they do. They make a couple of high-end little productions from their property, some of their old vines. They make an old vine production. But this is their this is what is out in the world is this Champolo Vouvray. Let's taste it. I'm gonna go back to the notes there so you can read them. I think I skipped through those a little quick. Um there's a lot of competition in this town. This is a pretty touristic app uh, location as well, Vouvray. Uh, and so there's a lot of wineries that are kind of set up just for the tourism. Uh, this is not one of them. Uh, really love wines from great producers in this area. We carry those on our store. I have a, a few different facings for Vouvray. I like Chenin Blanc a lot. It's a really interesting grape variety, um, but maybe a little harder to incorporate into a meal plan. It talks here about how well it goes with shellfish and vegetable and Japanese dishes, um, fish and meats. Uh, Shannon, Shannon has is is kind of a, a one that you really have to kind of work hard to get it into the meal. Um, if you're cooking French cuisine, maybe not. But um, I I I own a lot of Shannon Blanc, but I find it hard to remember to use it to drink it. I do use it a lot for a lot of my cheese programs, and I use it a lot. Um, often with white cheeses, a lot of goat cheeses. I like to pair the cheeses with condiments to present uh, Chenin Blanc. I like Chenin Blanc from different parts of the world. I'm a big fan of South Africa. I'm a big fan <clears throat> of it dry and I'm a big fan of it with some sweetness as well. But here the, the Champlou brand makes it in a drier style. You can look at the, the wine in the glass. You can see it's kind of got that hay color to it. A little bit of oxidation. They're using it um, in a very dry style. You can pick up um, <clears throat> some white cheese elements on the nose. Um, there's definitely some uh, stone fruits like apricot. Um, it has a, a, a solid amount of herb and vegetative notes as well. And I think it get, gets into a pretty hardcore place here in this 2020 dry sec. That means dry uh, Vouvray. The mouth the, the nose and the mouth here can kind of take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, I think I like the nose a lot and it really is savory. 
it ha it makes me think of uh dishes with like chopped olives almonds some garlic some uh capers uh involved in the food um you know like a chicken dish um with those type of of ingredients i would i would bridge that on the nose to that to that chicken dish to that uh roasted chicken potentially some uh fish with those type of ingredients as well lemon caper uh whole fish maybe fish encrusted in salt have you ever cooked that i was at a restaurant the other day where they were doing a table side um thing with a fish baked fish where they basically cover it in salt and then they bake it in under the salt they bring it to the table and they chip it out of the salt and i was I was like, wow, I was so happy the restaurant I worked in never did that because that looks like so much work. But um, fascinating and delicious because it locks in the moisture into the fish. It doesn't make the fish salty. Um, that's not what the salt is there to do. But it it's, um, it's really a beautiful presentation and dramatic and really optimal, I think, when talking about a wine like this to get it kind of in the mood. And I think this is a wine that really almost requires French cuisine. You know, it's, it's this, I, I, I guess I read Japanese, maybe, maybe some Japanese food as well. There's a lot of umami, but uh, whenever I taste this wine, I remember being in the Loire Valley and I remember having things like terrine, vegetable terrines and uh casserole type of dishes and things that have like that like i said some of those pointed um acute flavors like the caper berries um like the sliced almonds um that really kind of accentuate a dish and almost take it over what do you think of that one When I agree with Natalie. That... Natalie, my favorite out of the four so far. And yeah, I, I agree with her, and it goes great with my cheese, finally. Yeah. All right. All right. That's a good one. It's a dependable producer if you like this style. Thanks for the food tipsy, and that is a hard wine to pair. I wrote down what you said on that. You know, and I'm sure if you're from the Loire Valley, you'd want to maybe slap me across the face for saying that because, you know, you're accustomed to using it. But I'm not, and I, I'm not accustomed to using these wines, but I always love them when I do drink them. So I'm going to make it a make it a project this next week to make a dish and to bring out a dry Shannon because man I own some great ones in, in fact something's happening right now on my website maybe it's been the heat we just eviscerated my Shannon Blanc selection somebody came in and bought so much of it I get to do some shopping again though that's the good news <laughs> that's good this one also is great all by itself absolutely it's a wine. very nice very near the uh, the town of Ouvray, there are some other great Shannon based appellations. Sauvignier is one that I always remind people to think about. And that is one of the wines that I think just got eviscerated from my website. I had a, a vertical of, of Sauvignier, the very famous uh, Sauvignier uh, Chateau owner, Mr. Bamard, passed away this week. Maybe someone was uh, seeking out some souvenir to celebrate Mr. Bamard's life. Chateau de, B de Bamard. It's been around for a long time. Great souvenir producer. Um, all right. We are moving on to wine number five already.
So I'm, I'm not sure where everybody lives, but I know some of you aren't in the Los Angeles zone. And we here in Los Angeles did just survive our first hurricane in like a generation. In fact, we had the hurricane earthquake combo, but it luckily was more of a news headline than an event for most of us. Thank God. Uh, the word earthquake and wine store don't go very well together. So, uh, um, and in fact, I don't like, I don't really believe in predictions, but I had told my team um, that we're going to take some extra steps because I think we're entering into earthquake season. And we had just taken a lot of the wines that were kind of stacked up next to each other standing up on the top shelf and we moved everything to the bottom shelves over the last two weeks just before that happened so my team thought i was at least wise to that possibility and uh, <clears throat> the store's never been in better working order we're in really good shape and we had zero zero losses during this earthquake this was a teeny one don't need anything bigger. Lots of teeny ones are good. Wine number five is um, again from Chevrolet and works to find value. Um, and it's been a really charming wine. I've had this wine in different vintages for the past several years. It's from my friends at Wine Wise. They bring this in for me. Um, it's a little Chevrony Rouge. It is a, a blend of different grape varieties. But this little teeny little producer uh, just really is consistent and priced very sensitive. And here we go. Here's a little look at their property. Bellier is the name of the producer. Everything um, they do is just really hands-on, small produ production, hand-harvested. This is Pinot Noir and Gamay from their 20-hectare estate, um, which is pretty sizable, actually. 20 hectares, that's like 60 acres. <clears throat> um, growing on sandy... A limestone soils. So Pinot and Gamay, when you do that in Burgundy, you can make a wine called Pasteur Grand. Um, and you, typically that is a, almost a 50-50 Pinot Gamay blend. And it's uh, just something kind of novel they, that some of the producers do. Um, but it's actually a, a valid category in Chevrony. I would say if Chevrony were known for anything, it's this wine here, the, the Pinot and Gamay blend. This is pretty, this is kind of a, a typical little farmer, small producer blend. It gives you a lot of value um, it's a wonderful wine that can be served with a, a little chill. I like these light skin, thin skin varietal blends like this at a cooler temperature. Low alcohol, nice, ref refreshing. Um, uh, leans on to the earthy side of the spectrum. But this is uh, meant to be a deal, and it is. It's $15.95. Um, it's a fun little, don't have to think too much about it to open this bottle up and just have a nice simple glass of wine any day of the week. Probably need to have a little bit of love for that French character, that more earth than fruit. But it's not hard to like this wine. It's just 
You just have to be okay with it being so light and subtle. Um, I, I I would love a wine like this. Right now, I'm I'm this is I'm kind of entering into my my vegetarian part of the year. I I do tend to try to clean up my blood a little bit. I do cut back on the alcohol pretty hard, um, and I go into about a 30 to 60 day period where I'm, I'm not really vegetarian, hardcore, but, um, <clears throat> uh, because I do, I do, do still have some dinners and stuff that I host and I, but I'll, I may, may not even eat the proteins. If I'm, if I'm, I'm in a good spot, feeling strong, I can, I can stay away from it. Um, and, um, I love this with, um, some of the vegetarian foods that I'm, I'm going to be eating more of over the next couple of weeks. Um, maybe some of the tofu type of dishes, a lot of mushrooms, a lot of risotto, um, red flesh fish though, is really optimal with this slightly chilled light bodied red. I'd love a, a, a piece of uh, salmon. I'd love, love to sear my salmon in the broiler, skin up, get that skin really crispy and barely cook the other side. And, um, um, and that would be a lot of fun with a wine like this. I might do some like mushroom mashed potatoes with a, some seared salmon and a wine like this, but that, that would probably be my same recipe for Pinot Noir or, or Beaujolais as well. Uh, great for Thanksgiving, great for big dinner parties. This is a wine that you can be generous with. And um, I uh, this is probably my third vintage in a row. I just sell maybe a case or two a year. Um, and just kind of people put it in assortment packs a lot. Um, uh, so I uh, hope you guys enjoyed that. Anyone want to comment about our Chevrony Rouge smoked Gouda? Ooh, that's good. Went a lot also, and I didn't feel like it was too light. I felt like the spice and, and the fruit flavors just filled that in so well that it doesn't come across as a light, subtle wine to me. It had a, a little bit more, um, there's some good structure here. There's some nice acidity. And um, I think that that can, can be pretty, I mean, I think the wine is mostly acidity because it's not big and ripe and fruity and alcoholic. So the acidity really rules the, the wine here. And uh, I, de I definitely think that this is like that, perfect little pairing wine for the right little dish or or two um you know a, a really fun dish for this would be ratatouille It'd be really fun with this with this particular wine yeah any like umami dish like you said mushroom i think mushrooms would be great with this one for sure hmm. getting hungry now all right wine number Six. My Dodger game got round, rained out today. I got to do some big time Dodger stuff this last weekend. I was supposed to go to the Dodger game on Sunday, but because of the storm, they moved it to Saturday, which was kind of cool. It was, it was um, luckily I was available to go Saturday morning. When they moved, they moved the game to Saturday morning and they played a double header on Saturday. Uh, but the coolest thing of all is that um, I was given some amazing seats. These were a gift. And I got to sit in some great seats for the game. And uh, so the Saturday morning, because they moved the game, there was hardly anybody there. Um, and that was kind of fun too. It was only the hardcore were there, but, um, on Thursday, 
I got these radical seats given to me for the Thursday game. And that was, that was also just stunning. I only get to go to a couple games a year. I listen to almost every single game. And we are 11 games ahead of our second place rival, but we are needing to beat the Braves. So we've got a, a lot of work to do. Four games, maybe five games up on us. We're moving into wine number six, which, which is uh, um, our classic Chinon tonight. Chinon is made from Cabernet Franc. Oops, just clicked into the, let me get back to the slideshow. I think that's it. Yeah, there we go. Chinon. This is, uh, <clears throat> I have a couple different quality levels of Chinon on the website. This is a, a wine that actually somehow got less expensive than it was a couple of years ago. Um, I'm not sure if that's because they've streamlined their importer, they bought some additional vineyards, they've had some things happen, why it became a little less expensive, a little more competitive. I think they were going for more, more U.S. business. But this is a, this is just kind of a, a, a classic Chinon Cabernet Franc stainless steel production made by a, a, a very dependable brand that's got a very strong imprint on the business. Um, uh, Bertrand Sodaris um, is the name of the, the owner here. <laughs> Try that again. Can you hear me okay? Is that you, Wendy? There was a lot of echo there, Wendy. Sorry. Come back when you're ready. But here's the domain de Palacis. And it is uh, a, a really highly thought of a state. This is their this is their core production. Cabernet Franc is not actually a focus variety anywhere else in France, except for the Loire Valley. It is part of the Bordeaux composition. There's Cabernet Franc throughout Bordeaux. Yeah, sorry, that echo is strong. But uh, Cabernet Franc has is it's a first of all it's a mother grape variety so a lot of grape varieties come from being um, exposed to Cabernet Franc so a couple of different grape varieties get together and they produce other grape varieties Cabernet Sauvignon is a byproduct of Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc getting together a white and a red grape variety they uh, created Cabernet Sauvignon. Merlot is a is a uh, offspring of Cabernet Franc as well. So this one grape variety gave us a lot of other grape varieties. And, but on its own, I think it it has a, a a little bit of a mystique about the way it presents itself. It's hyper earthy. It tends to smell a lot like things like graphite. Um, I went to college with a young man who became an architect, and this is in a time period where they were using pencil, and so the room, the house, always smelt like pencil lead and pencil eraser, and I get both of those when I smell Cabernet Franc. <clears throat> a lot of people call it graphite. I call it architect pencil lead. Um, there's a lot of parazines, the smell of basically vegetal smells in bell, like bell pepper, pretty fragrant. And uh, it, Cabernet Franc is really unique that way. 
Um, I actually sometimes crave this wine. I'm not sure why, but I'll be like, I really feel like having a chenol or like a little little um, vegetal glass of of Cabernet Franc. Has a pretty assertive tannins. And here they're talking a lot about it going um, as a floral and spicy character that pairs well with sausages and goat cheeses. Not exactly the top of the food chain, but um, we do have a great sausage destination in downtown LA, right on the street where I live. It's called Verse Couche, and it is the sausage kitchen and they they have like 20 beers on tap and they have one red wine by the glass cab franc chinon i think it is is what it is um so okay sausages um but i i actually think that this wine would go pretty well with anything with some pretty nice grill marks on it um whether it be lamb or grilled lamb chops or like pork chop that you maybe would saute or grill and have a nice kind of char on the outside. I'd like to see the cooking method be pretty involved in kind of presenting itself to, to match this, this assertive nose. Um, It's pretty damn um, excellent with food. Um, I, I really like that drying effect of the of the tannins. Um, kind of makes your mouth water a little bit. Can I, it, uh, uh, actually a nice filet mignon, which can be a little boring if you and you can overwhelm a filet with some some uh, red wine sometimes too. Um, but a really nice uh, uh, kind of crispy crusted filet mignon. And the best place here in LA is Boa Steakhouse on Sunset. They do this great filet with some mashed potatoes. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I could just see sitting at the bar at Boa having a glass of this wine with that filet. No sauce, just super pure about it. Might not, I might have a hard time working this into my uh, into my vegetarian diet, though. I'm really feeling like this one needs some meat. Maybe some charcuterie. You have it often. Um, if, if you go to Paris, you you go to a little corner cafe. They tend to have like a Beaujolais, a Chinon, and then you they upsell you into a Bordeaux. Um, the, these are kind of categoric, nice value wines, maybe a Caor, maybe a, um, the Beaujolais and the Chinon. Um, and this is uh, often what you will get. This is probably a little bit better than that wine you're going to get in Paris too. So it's... it's it's pretty nice for uh, for value oriented chinon and the producers, you know, super authentic, uh, very hardworking. This is a, at this price point, you have to be pretty efficient. Probably a small team does everything by hand. Less than twenty bucks a bottle. You guys all got a discount code tonight. <clears throat> Uh, that you can work to even apply towards saving even more money. Take a look at the email for that. Um, and you can use that until tomorrow night. If you want to pick up any of these gems, save a little, little more money. There's some real value in the Loire Valley. I could also do the same presentation with wines that are 50 to to $100 a bottle. There's some very almost cult level 
collectibles. The Wa Valley kind of presents both sides of the track very well. Really good values for every day, but some real classic benchmarks that are still worths in your cellar and age beautifully. I think it, it uh, the future is very good for the Wa Valley because of that value opportunity, because of the the improving conditions that they're working on in France to continue to elevate vineyards and to elevate uh, and create more quality oriented zones. You're going to see some vineyard designations, some more premier crews, some more type of things like that to continue to try to get people to work towards elevating their brands. Also that continued movement towards sustainability. Um, that's really important to the wine industry worldwide, but certainly in France, there's a whole you know, uh, tax situation that's starting to develop over there, carbon taxes and things like that. So we're going to see their their politics even kind of reward producers for being more sustainable and for having a lower carbon footprint. That that's happened in many other parts of the world, and it it ends up being a positive for the wine industry. Um. Any questions for me that you'd like me to talk about or? I, I just have a comment, which is my initial take on the nose was of rose. Maybe I was unduly led by the label. Oh, like a rose pet, like a, a nose full of roses? Like, like rose petal, but you know, mature kind of rose hmm. nose. Like a, yeah, a, a, almost like a, um bouquet of flowers that has um not fresh flowers but ones that are like wide open and they're they they're pretty fragrant and expressive um that's a that's that's a i think you're right i think that's it's it's right in there and the picture which i've always just kind of seen but not paid much attention to is a bunch of roses so um there you go it's not it's necessarily very intriguing and great wine. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 I think the floral uh, comments on a red wine are uh, often miss, uh, not not mentioned enough, because uh, red wines can have a lot of floral character to them as well, and uh, especially if you're put them in a, in, a, in a beautiful glass and you got them at the right temperature. Those are, these are the type of subtleties that we could really pick up on. I hope you enjoyed the program tonight. It's been nice tasting with you. I enjoy doing these every Wednesday night. And I'm, I will say that <clears throat> the next several weeks, we've got some pretty damn special comings togethers. One of my uh, favorites going to be next week. Uh, I'm going to get to my Zoom into Wine page and share that with you so I can talk about it. You can see what I'm talking about. But next week, we have my friend Jason Court on the Zoom with me. And he uh, has worked with some great people in the Napa Valley. He has his own label now called Evidence Wines. Um, and he has over the over three vintages received 97, 98, and 99. So we're going to talk to him about what does a perfect wine taste like? We're going to taste his 97, 98, and 99 point wine. And I, because he's a friend of mine, he is really involved in this tasting. And that's the only way we were able to get this tasting out for about 25 bucks. This is a super value. We're going to taste $400 worth of his Cabernet. And uh, he sells his wines for north of a hundred bucks a bottle. We're going to taste three of them and we're going to be able to ask him a lot of questions. He's a really fun, delightful human being. I think you'll really enjoy him. And, uh, you know, he's excited because he wants people to discover his wine. So I said, I'm going to work hard to get, get some new people, some new fans for you. And you'll have a personal connection with him after next week if you join us. $25 for one flight. I think two flights is actually 45 bucks. So even less. <clears throat> if you want a bottle kit, we do have one more remaining, but that's it. 
Thanks, everybody. Hope you have a great night. Go Dodgers. Bye, everyone.